Uh, good afternoon uh, from Paris, France, uh, and uh, welcome to all our uh, online connected participants from all over the world uh, for this third uh, EcoSense webinar, which is entitled uh, Clinical Usefulness of Fibroscan and Fibrometer in the Context of Non-Alcoholic Fatty Liver Disease. Uh, my name is Marc Lando. I am in charge of the clinical training for EcoSense and I will be the moderator of this session. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce you with uh, the two experts we have invited today. So Dr. Jérôme Boursier from the Hepatogastroenterology Unit of the Angers Hospital in France. Welcome Hi, Jérôme. Thanks for being with us today. And Professor Victor de Ledingan, uh, Head of Gastroenterology Unit of the Bordeaux Hospital, France. Welcome uh, Victor. Good afternoon, Mark. So, uh, this webinar will be divided in three, uh, three parts. First, our experts will share with us their own experience on the use of non-invasive markers such as fibroscan and fibrometer in the context of NAFLD. Second, there will be a presentation of clinical cases and discussion between our two experts. And third, there will be as well an interactive questions and answer sessions. So you had all the opportunity to send us questions and uh, thank you for your participation. You are still highly encouraged to send us additional questions uh, by using the live chat window uh, you have in front of you. We will select the questions and try to address all of them uh, at the end of this uh, webinar session. Uh, now it's time for me to give the floor to our experts and uh, I hope you will enjoy this uh, webinar session. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hi, uh, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be, to be here to speak about uh, non-invasive fibrosis test in NAFL that uh, I think it's a very hot topic and an important subject for, uh, for the physician and especially the pathologist because uh, we see more and more of this patient in our daily clinical practice. So maybe uh, for, to start, a few words about natural history and the epidemiology of NAFL. Uh, as you know, uh, NAFL includes a wide spectrum of, uh, of liver disease, from simple steatosis uh, to, to fibrosis, cirrhosis, and its complication. And the, the common lesion, liver steatosis, is highly frequent in the general population. The prevalence ranges from 6 to 33 percent and could reach 40 to 50 percent in some part of the, of the world. Not all all of these patients will develop the, the aggressive form of the, the disease, the so-called NASH, the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, uh, that is defined by the presence of steatosis plus uh, inflammation, and the prevalence of NASH is estimated in the general population around 3 to 5 percent, that it's quite high for, for a disease. I think that NASH is uh, an important event in the natural history of the disease because uh, it's the main predictor of fibrosis progression and evolution to, to, to cirrhosis. Uh, so next slide, please. And uh, as you see on this slide, as in other causes of chronic liver disease, fibrosis is the main determinant of the liver-related prognosis. You see here the occurrence of a liver-related uh, event as a function of the fibrosis stage as defined by the NASH CRNUS classification. And as you can see, those patients with mild disease, F0, F1 or F2 fibrosis stage, have a quite good prognosis. And on on the contrary, those patients with F3 or F4, so those patients with advanced fibrosis, have an impaired prognosis. So in, in clinical practice, the real challenge for the physician and the hepatologist is to identify among the world patients with NAFL the small subset of patients with advanced disease because those patients are at risk of liver-related complications. So how can we do? There are the latest guidelines of the EESLD that say that liver biopsy should be considered in patients with NAFL who are at increased risk to have steatohepatitis and advanced fibrosis. 
And also the presence of the metabolic syndrome at the NAFL fibrosis score may be used for identifying patients who are at risk for steatohepatitis and advanced fibrosis. So I think it's an important recommendation because for the first time, the ESLD recommend the use of non-invasive fibrosis tests to screen patients at risk for liver-related complications. So what are the various means to evaluate liver fibrosis in, uh, in, uh, in clinical practice in, uh, in NAFL? There are three, three, two main uh, ways, the liver biopsy and also now the non-invasive fibrosis test that you can categorize into two ways, the blood fibrosis test and, uh, and the elastography. So first, liver biopsy because it's still the, the reference. Uh, it allows to evaluate the steatosis, the, the, the grade and the percentage of steatosis to make the diagnosis of NASH and also to determine the prognosis by evaluating the amount of, uh, of fibrosis. The problem of liver biopsy is it's an invasive procedure. There are sample bias, problem of uh, inter-observer reproducibility and I think you can't propose a liver biopsy to all nephil patients because that would mean to propose liver biopsy to 20 to 30 percent of the general population. So there is a question need for non-invasive tools to select those patients who are at risk of liver-related complication and in this setting uh, non-invasive fibrosis tests are very interesting. I will first speak about the, the blood the test and then Victor will speak about the, the electrometry. So the first blood fibrosis test that is the I think the, the, the most known and the most validated is the NAFL fibrosis score. It has been first published in uh, 2007 and, uh, by Angulo from the Mayo Clinic and it includes uh, simple markers as you see here, age, BMI, the presence of diabetes, serum transaminases, platelets and uh, albumin. These parameters are combined in a quite complex mathematical algorithm that you can't uh, calculate by head but there are online calculators that allow for a very easy and quick calculation at, uh, at bedside. So how can you uh, interpret the NAFL fibrosis score? There are two diagnostic cutoff, uh, lower cutoff, minus 1.455. Below this cutoff, the patient is assumed to have mild disease, so no advanced fibrosis, and the negative predictive value is very good, uh, around 90%. There is also a higher cutoff, 0.676. Uh, above which the patient is assumed to have uh, advanced fibrosis and the positive predictive value is also quite good, uh, around 85%. The problem, I think, with the NAFL fibrosis score is that there is a gray zone between these two cutoffs uh, where the diagnostic is, uh, remains undeterminated and uh, according to the publication you see that in this gray zone it's approximately half and a half, half of the patients who have no advanced fibrosis and half of the patients who had advanced fibrosis and around 30 to 50 percent of the patients fall in this gray zone where the diagnosis is uh, undeterminated. The next uh, blood fibrosis test is the fibrometer that has been first published a little later in 2009. As the NAFL fibrosis score, it includes uh, very simple parameters, the weight, the serum transaminases, platelets, glycemia and ferritin, also in a complex mathematical algorithm, but there are also online calculations uh, available. And uh, you can see uh, on the picture, uh, the OROC, the fibrometer was uh, significantly better than the NAFL fibrosis score for the diagnosis of uh, advanced fibrosis in the, in the first publication. So the next slide, please. Thank you. Here uh, there is a table that summarizes the, the diagnostic performance of the, of the, of the fibrometer. First, you have to understand that the fibrosis stage here on the left column uh, are those of the Metavir scoring system. And now in publication about non-invasive fibrosis test in NAFL, most of the publication use the NASH CRN US classification. That is not exactly the same that the Metavir staging. If you want to have a very simple equivalence, you have to understand that F3, F4, according to the US classification, is equivalent to F2 
two, F3, F4, according to the Metavia uh, scoring system. So here you can see on the first line that uh, fibrometer NAFL was uh, more accurate than the NAFL fibrosis score for the diagnosis of advanced fibrosis, and there was no difference for the, the diagnosis of, uh, of cirrhosis. Next slide. I think that uh, another advantage of the fibrometer is that when you obtain the results after asking for a calculation, you have this kind of fibrosis classification that gives you an estimation of the fibrosis test from the, the blood test results. You see here that the fibrometer results range from 0 to, to 1, and here the, the black bar show you that the, the, the diagnosis uh, uh, on the, the estimated fibrosis stage is uh, around F2. So there is no gray zone. You always have uh, a diagnosis by using the fibrometer uh, Neffold and uh, um, this classification once again is based on the Metavir fibrosis staging so those patients at risk of liver related complications are those in the yellow, the orange and or the, the red zone. So with a simple blood test calculation, with simple parameter, you have an estimation of the fibrosis stage, and you can categorize the patient in the group without increased risk of liver related complication, or in the group with increased risk of liver related complication. And if you can individualize those kind of patient, you can manage them and uh, do the, the best as the best as possible. Thank you, Jérôme. So now we will uh, discuss about the physical method, especially fibro scan. So as you know, uh, liver stiffness uh, can be evaluated using fibro scan. Uh, it allows rapid bedside painless and quantitative measurement of liver stiffness in kilopascal and with values from 1.5 to 75 kilopascal. Uh, as you know, uh, there is a high inter and intra-observer reproducibility and uh, with uh, uh, fibro scan you have a hundred times bigger evaluation than liver biopsy. The higher the stiffness in kilopascal, the more fibrosis in the liver. So in NAFOL, the first study was uh, published using M-probe uh, and as you can see on this slide on the left using fiber scan and liver stiffness measurement with an OROC of 7.9, you have a very good negative predictive value for the diagnosis of severe fibrosis, as you can see here on the left. And on the right, you can see that in patients with liver stiffness over 9.6, you have a very good positive predictive value. It was with the M probe. Next slide. <coughs> so to interpret the result you have using fiber scan with M probe, you have two different cutoffs. The first one is 7.9, and with this cutoff, you have a very good negative predictive value for the diagnosis of severe fibrosis, around 90%. And over 9.6 kilopascal, you have a, a good positive predictive value for the diagnosis of advanced fibrosis, around 72%. Next slide. But uh, in overweight or obese patients, you cannot obtain a good measurement of liver stiffness using MPROB. Therefore, a new device was developed, and on this slide, you have the comparison of M and XL probe. And I think the most important information is uh, that you have to know uh, measurement deaths with M probe, as you can see, it's between 2.5 and 6.5 centimeter. And for XL probe, it's between 3.5 and 7.5 centimeter. Next slide. Therefore, another study was published, uh, and uh, in this study, only NAFOL patients were included, and both patients had M and XL probe examination, 
And as you can see, no difference was observed between AND and XL probe for the diagnosis of significant fibrosis, severe fibrosis, and for the diagnosis of cirrhosis. Next slide. So, which cutoff do we have to use in, uh, with XL probe for the diagnosis of severe fibrosis in NAFOL patient? So, with XL probe, the cutoff is 7.2 to have a good negative predictive value for severe fibrosis, as you can see here, with uh, NPV around 89%. And for the diagnosis of severe fibrosis with a positive predictive value of 71%, the cutoff value is 9.3. Next slide. So it was to evaluate fibrosis. But now, with FibroScan, we can evaluate also steatosis. And how? It's using CAP. CAP for control attenuation parameter. So CAP has been devised, devised to target liver steatosis specifically. So CAP quantifies ultrasonic attenuation in the liver directly related to steatosis amount. Stiffness and CAP measurements are performed simultaneously and at the same place in the liver. The difference between liver stiffness and CAP is the expression. CAP is expressed in decibel per meter and range from 100 to 400 de decibel per meter. The more steatosis, the higher CAP will be. So what is the performance of CAP for the diagnosis of steatosis? Uh, on, this slide, on this slide, you can see that the performance of CAP for the diagnosis of steatosis whatever the grade of steatosis, S1, S2, F3, is better than stato test, which is a blood sample test, and fatty liver index, which is a blood sample test. And as you can see, whatever the, the quantity of steatosis, OROCs of CAP are always better than the others. Next slide. But maybe the most important with CAP is that CAP is associated with all parameters of the metabolic syndrome. As you can see on the left, you have on the first figure, A, all parameters the patient have for a metabolic syndrome, from zero, no parameter, to five, all parameters of the metabolic syndrome. And as you can see, CAP increases according to the number of parameters of the metabolic syndrome the patient has. Uh, you can see on B figure that in patients with metabolic syndrome, CAP values are higher than in patients without. You have the same result in, patient, in obese patients and in patients with diabetes or patients with elevated waist circumference. So maybe this result is very important to evaluate the risk factor of a patient to have <coughs> steatosis and a, a severe steatosis. Next slide. Uh, so many studies evaluated CAP for the diagnosis of steatosis, but uh, to, our, to our knowledge, there is no study evaluating the performance of CAP for in patients with NAFLD. In the last, in J. Patol, it's patients with, with NAFLD, but also HCV or HBV infection. Therefore, today, we don't know the performance of CAP for the diagnosis of steatosis in NAFL patient. However, when you compare all these results, you can see that in all these studies, the cutoff, uh, the OROC, sorry, for the diagnosis of steatosis was uh, quite good uh, for the diagnosis of all stages of steatosis. Next slide. Uh, we will present uh, during ARCLD meeting in, in two weeks the first result of the diagnosis 
of steatosis using CAP using Excel Pro. Today, you can evaluate steatosis with CAP only in M probe. Now, you will be able to use CAP in Excel probe, and as you can see on this slide, there is no difference between M and Excel probe for the diagnosis of steatosis. Therefore, you will be able to evaluate steatosis using CAP both with M or Excel probe. Next slide. So thank you for this first part. Uh, just as a conclusion, maybe you have a few words to, a few comments to give to, to the assistants as take home messages. Uh, so, in clinical practice, you have fibrometer NAFLD, NAFL fibrosis score, and liver stiffness measurement by fibroscan, which are accurate methods to rule out or rule in advanced fibrosis in NAFLD. Their prognostic values need further evaluation. Now, steatosis can easily be diagnosed using ultrasonography for steatosis over 30%. <coughs> and steatosis could be quantified and followed using CAP measured by fiber scan. Thank you. So I suggest now to start to discuss different clinical cases you, you, you built for this webinar. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe Jérôme, you would like to start to present clinical case number one, and then we'll have opportunity again to, to discuss if you have any questions related to the, these cases. Again, feel free to send them uh, by using the, the live chat. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So by, by these clinical cases, we, we try to, to illustrate what happened in the, in the real life, but uh, be sure that uh, in real life is uh, always more complicated. So let's uh, have a nice discussion, ask all the questions you want, and uh, we will try to, to answer them. So the first clinical case is a 48-year-old uh, female. Uh, she has past history of arterial hypertension that is treated by Lozartan. She is is uh, obese with a BMI uh, uh, of uh, 30, 31. She has uh, elevated uh, serum transaminases. The glycemia is quite normal, as the triglyceride and the HDL cholesterol. The HBV and HCV are uh, serology are negative. The ferritin is normal, and the ultrasonography shows br um, bright liver. So we assume that the, this, patient, uh, this patient has an FLD, and I want to ask you, Victor, which fibrosis test would you perform to evaluate liver fibrosis in this case? So, Jérôme, I think this patient has only one factor, uh, one parameter of the metabolic syndrome. She's overweight. And she has, a she has a hypertension, uh, sorry. So I think with only two uh, parameters, I think there is no severe fibrosis, as I assume. So first, I will start with only uh, one test. And uh, it depends what you have, a blood test or a fiber scan. So what did you do? Okay, so we have the answer on the screen. Oh, before I didn't check it. So, Sorry. <laughs> so I, I think you're right. The, the, it's, uh, uh, the ACLD guidelines say that uh, the more criteria of the metabolic syndrome there is, uh, the higher is the risk of NASH and, uh, and uh, significant or advanced liver fibrosis. So here it's not the case. So there is only two uh, criteria of the metabolic syndrome. And we know also that uh, the non-invasive test, either the blood test or the, the, the fiber scan, have a very good negative predictive value. So in this case, uh, I would start only with one uh, non-invasive test. And as you can see on the, on the slides, they are all in agreement. If you do the NAFL fibrosis score, it's minus 3.413. That is below the, the lower threshold. The fibrometer NAFL is also very low. And the fibro scan is below 7, 5.6 kilopascal. So they are all in agreement. If you start with one, uh, you will have a diagnosis of no advanced fibrosis. And I think it's 
sufficient. And the liver biopsy confirmed the, the diagnosis. The fibrosis was very low. Uh, F1 stage, uh, according to the NASH CRN uh, classification. In, in the cases, we will all give the classification uh, of the NASH CRN to be uh, homogeneous. And uh, so, I think you, you're right. The, the context is good. The negative predictive value of blood fibrosis test is very good. So I think in this case, only one non-invasive test is sufficient. Okay, clear answer. Maybe next, uh, next clinical case. Thank you. So the second clinical case is a 33-year-old female. She has past history of uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome and dyslipidemia treated by rosuvastatin. She is uh, obese with a very high BMI of uh, 38. Um, she, had also, uh, she has also elevated serum transaminases, but uh, uh, a met uh, metabolic context with a high uh, glycemia, elevated triglyceride, low HDL. Once again, the HBV and HCV serology are negative and the ferritin uh, is uh, normal. So in this context, uh, what would you do uh, as far as this test, Victor? Uh, don't show me the, the answer, don't show me please. Before. Uh, so I think this female has five parameters of mm -hmm. the metabolic syndrome, so I'm quite sure she has fibrosis. So I, I will perform one test, either blood or a fiber scan, and if this test is concordant with what I think, I will stop. But if I have a test and the result is uh, no fibrosis or mild fibrosis, I will perform another one because I think, according to all parameters you showed, uh, I suspect a severe fibrosis. But what did you do? It's exactly this. Do, do you know these patients? You know the history? You know That's the answer? I, I even need all of the males. So show, show the results, please. It's exactly this. Because it's a real patient I see in, uh, in clinical practice. And uh, I started the liver fibrosis evaluation with a fibrometer nephron. And as you can see, the results was absolutely normal, 0 0.01. So this suggests, with a very uh, high probability, the absence of uh, advanced fibrosis. And not also that the NIFL fibrosis score was, uh, was also negative. I think that the first message is to know that if a blood test is negative, uh, uh, other blood tests will probably also be negative. So if you want to do a second test because you don't trust the results, because you think it could be a false negative, I think if you want to do a second test when you start with a blood test, you have to change the method. You start with a biochemical method, a blood fibrosis test, then you go to a physical method like the fibro scan. And in okay. the other side, if you start with a fibro scan, you want to do another test, you have to do uh, a blood fibrosis right. test. So I started in this patient with a, a fibro meter nephron, but like Victor, I was very quite surprised of these very normal results in the context of a uh, high metabolic syndrome. So I did uh, a fiber scan and the results was high, 11.9 uh, kilopascals. So there was discrepancy between both methods and uh, we performed liver biopsy that confirmed that there was advanced fibrosis F3 with bridging fibrosis on the, on the, on the histological uh, uh, evaluation. So be careful, uh, there could be no, uh, false negative results, false positive results also, and sometimes, uh, depending on the context, it's very interesting to combine both methods, biochemical and a physical method, to reach uh, better negative predictive value and even more better predictive, positive predictive value. But Jerome, does it mean that fibro scan is always better than blood sample? I didn't show a clinical case where fibro scan was a uh, false negative uh, with a uh, no. I think okay. that it's I, I quite so. it's quite it's quite equivalent. There are situations where uh, blood fibro tests are wrong and could be um, uh, corrected by the fibro scan, and there are also uh, the, the 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 opposite. As I said at the beginning, life is never simple. <laughs> Okay, so I suggest now, because we have enough time, to, to maybe start to try to answer uh, the questions that were sent to us uh, by email or by using the live chat. So maybe we will start with uh, the first one, uh, which has been sent by several uh, people. Question from John. 
John asks, asks us, does steatosis, according to your experience, significantly affect the liver stiffness measured by FibroScan in an AFLD patients? Uh, just to start, and after you will show your results, just to say that many studies evaluated this interaction and results are discordant. So at this time, I'm not sure we have the good answer, but maybe Jérôme, you could moderate this this information. You're, you're, I think you're right because the data in the literature are really conflicting. So there is a big controversy. But you have first to understand that most of the studies that evaluated the impact of liver steatosis on the fiber scan results, we, spoke, we speak about liver stiffness eh, for fibrosis evaluation. They, they, they measure steatosis according to, the, to the, the pathological steatosis grade, 0, 1, 2, 3. And this method is not very sensitive. I think I will show you that steatosis could have an impact, but it is quite small compared to fibrosis. So if you don't have a sensitive method, you won't be able to detect this impact. As an example, if you have a patient with 10% of hepatocyte containing a lipid vesicle and another patient with 30%, so three times more, they, be, they will be both together in the grade one. So a wide range of steatosis, but the same grade. And on the other side, if you take a patient with 30%, versus a patient with 40, it's not a so big change, but there is a change in the grade. So I think that uh, to detect small variation, small impact, you need uh, a very sensitive method. So in this study, you have the graph on the, on the slide, we uh, evaluate the liver lesion using morphometry. So by an automatic uh, system we develop in our center, we are able to measure the area of fibrosis, but also the area of uh, steatosis. And here you have the, 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 the bar. So uh, patient in the uh, X axis, it's the area of uh, fibrosis, so several levels of fibrosis. And uh, the three colors correspond to the area of steatosis. To give uh, an equivalence, uh, less than 1% of area of steatosis correspond to no steatosis. Between one to four of area of steatosis is approximately grade one, the classical grade one on liver biopsy, and more than four percent is uh, is, uh, the, is the grade two of grade three. We, it is a very sensitive method, reproducible method, and very accurate. And by using this, you show that uh, when the area of fibrosis is less than nine percent, you have a significant impact of liver steatosis. Not very high because it's two or three kilopascal and it disappears when the area of fibrosis is high. So when the liver is very hard, the steatosis has no impact. And when the liver is not, not hard, steatosis could have an impact. But it results in chronic hepatitis C patients and there, are, there is absolutely no study that use this kind of methodology in Neffeld. But because steatosis is the common lesion in Neffeld, it should be very interesting to do this kind of study to evaluate if steatosis has a significant impact. Thank you for this very clear answer. Uh, next question is um, how frequently uh, can the sequential measurement of fibroscan so stiffness or cap could be used to accurately predict the response to treatment or deterioration of steatosis or steatohepatitis over the time. So question sent by Marek. Let's go, Victor. Uh, I think you have two questions. One is for fibrosis and the other one is for steatosis. As you know that even in treated patients, and uh, for example, HBV patients or HCV patients, after virological response, uh, you need many, many months and years to observe a degree of liver fibrosis if you perform a liver biopsy. Therefore, with fiber scan, you will have the same, but with fiber scan, you could observe a degree of liver stiffness but this degree is not related to a degree of fibrosis. It's related to a degree of inflammation. Therefore, I think for the evaluation of liver fibrosis, we cannot recommend now uh, a sequential measurement of liver fibrosis 
uh, of liver stiffness in treated patients. However, in untreated patients, we know that fiber scan is very useful to follow fibrosis with time, and we know that the evolution of liver stiffness according to time is related to an increase of liver fibrosis. For steatosis, it's not the same. We know that steatosis can regress very quickly, and so maybe we could perform a, a CAP evaluation every month or uh, after one month of treatment of steatosis of uh, after uh, stopping uh, alcohol use and I'm sure we will observe a degree of cap but at this time we don't have any study showing this result so I, I, I'm sure we will observe that but we don't have any published information at this time. May, may I ask you, uh, uh, Victor, because you, you publish data about second chain measurement and the pronostic significance of them in, uh, in chronic hepatitis C, don't you think that finally the, the frequency of second chain measurement can be adapted also to the level of liver fibrosis as suggested by FibroScan? I, I, I want to say you, if the FibroScan suggests a low level of fibrosis, so you have mild disease and the naturalist will show you that you have time, so you can space the measurement, but if it suggest uh, advanced fibrosis, maybe you have to shorten, have a, a shorter uh, interval between the measurement. What do you think about it? I, I think I, I agree with you and for example in patients with uh, liver stiffness lower than seven, we know that we need time to, to the to, for the evolution to a, a cirrhosis, therefore maybe we can perform fibroscan examination every three years. But in uh, patients with a value uh, around 12 or over, I think in this patient, maybe it's better to evaluate liver stiffness every year mm. because we will observe an increase of liver stiffness and therefore uh, the prognosis uh, is, is not the same. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, please. So question three uh, from yes. Carolina, uh, who asks us, what is the recommended cap value, cap cutoff, to rule out the presence of steatosis, according to your experience? Thank you, Carolina, for this <laughs> very good question. <laughs> very difficult answer. Uh, I think, uh, at this time, uh, all publications uh, gave different cutoff for each grade of steatosis. So I don't have I don't have any correct cutoff value. I think in clinical practice you can use a cutoff around 300. I think when you have a value of cap over 300. That means that you, you will have steatosis, but is it steatosis around 40, 50, or 60 percent? I don't know, but I think it's over 30 percent. So I think 300 could be, could be a correct cutoff. And maybe, maybe in patients with a value lower than 200, you don't have any severe steatosis over 10 percent. It's not severe, a steatosis over 10 percent. But my, my answer is just clinical practice and uh, it's not published uh, result. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, speaking about CAP, uh, we all know about the reliability criteria for stiffness measurement, which uh, rely on the number of measurements, 10, and the IQR median ratio of stiffness in percentage. What would be the recommended criteria for a reliable cap measurement? Uh, so when you perform a cap examination, you perform at the same time a, a liver stiffness measurement. So you, have, you, you press the bottom and you have two results, liver stiffness and cap. So if you don't have any uh, measurement of liver stiffness, you don't have any measurement of cap, first step. The second one is that at this time, for the diagnosis, for, for correct cap, you just need 10 measurements. You don't have to check LSM IQR ratio or uh, another factor. It's only 10 measurements. So you don't have to use 
the same criteria for the, for the diagnosis of liver stiffness and the correct liver stiffness and for the diagnosis of steatosis using CAP. The, the only criteria for CAP is 10 measurement. I think it's what it was, right? Right, is it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question sent by uh, Maki. Uh, question that has been raised several times uh, by our participants. Uh, what are the causes of discrepancies observed between FibroScan M and FibroScan XL probe stiffness measurement performed on the same patient? Uh, it's what I said before uh, when you had the comparison between M and XL probe. Uh, one information you, you have to know, yeah, thank you very much, is the measurement depth of M probe and XL probe. And as you see, the depth it is not the same. It's 2.5 to 6.5 centimeter for M probe and 3.5 to 7.5 centimeter for XL probe. So you don't have the same value because you are deeper using XL probe. But now with the new devices, you have on the screen if you have to use M probe or XL probe. The, so in new devices, I think for two years, it's from yes, two years. That's, it. that's correct. So you, you, you don't have to, to, to check anything. You have to, to check your screen. And if uh, you, you see that you have to use the M-probe, please use the M-probe. And if, you, if, it's, uh, if it's indicated you need to use XL-probe, please use XL-probe. So and it, on this slide, you have a study uh, published by Myers. And when you recalculate values with M probe and values with XL probe uh, at the same place in the liver, you have exactly the same values. Therefore, it's just a question of uh, uh, the distance between the skin and the liver. But in clinical practice, sometimes you don't evaluate uh, the, 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 this length, but it, it's why you need to use the probe indicated on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have now another question, um, which is about a uh, fibrometer. <coughs> question number six. Is it possible to identify simple steatosis from non-alcoholic steatohepatitis based on stiffness, based on cap or fibrometer results in combination with the ALT levels? So it's, a, it's an excellent question and a very big problem for us because um, as, I, I, as I said at the beginning, NASH is an important step in the natural history of the disease. We always evaluate liver fibrosis because it's a pronostic marker, but we don't have a very efficient treatment. And we know in chronic liver disease, the, the, when you make a, an intervention uh, late, it is less uh, efficient. So maybe, and most of the new drugs are tested in NASH patients. I think it's the, the moment to make an intervention, but how to do the diagnosis uh, of NASH in a non-invasive manner. So first, serum trosaminase, you have to know that half of the patient with NASH have normal serum trosaminases. And uh, the, the, the non-invasive means that uh, are sp spoke in the, in the question are designed for, uh, for, for fibrosis. There is, today, clearly there is no um, validated uh, mean to diagnose NASH. Uh, some blood parameters have been tested, uh, like the CK18, with very interesting results at the beginning, but in larger studies with more patients, the diagnosis, well, the diagnostic accuracy was not so, so high. So there is clearly uh, a, 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 a need for research in this situation to, to improve the non-invasive diagnosis of uh, NASH. And I can't answer to this specific question because there is no data about the combination of ELT and uh, CAP or fibrometer or, or, or fibroscan to make the diagnosis of, uh, uh, of NASH. So the research is uh, ongoing and I hope we will very soon uh, have uh, some uh, panel of some new markers that will lead uh, available the 
non-invasive diagnosis of NASH. Okay, well noted. Thank you, Jérôme. Uh, next question now, uh, number seven, sent by Marie. Uh, what is actually the reference staging scoring system for fibrosis evaluation in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? So I guess we are speaking about the, the reference scoring, so the pathological fibrosis uh, scoring. Um, we discussed it before during the, this webinar because there are the NASH CRN US scoring and uh, uh, we also spoke about the, the Metavia scoring. I think that the, the, the the reference stage scoring is the NASH CRN1 because it has been developed for NEFL first, mm -hmm. whereas uh, Metavia fibrosis scoring was developed for uh, chronic uh, viral hepatitis. And also, most of the studies now uh, evaluate non invasive tests against the US classification. So, if we want to be homogeneous, if we want to speak the same language, if we want to compare the results, we have to, to use the same uh, scoring. And I think that now the NASH CRN US classification position uh, as the reference scoring in, uh, in NEFL. But, but what do you think about the new score by Pierre Bédossa? It was with steatosis, inflammation, fibrosis published, I think, two years ago. Yeah. In what? It was, um, I think that the main difference between the nash CRN scoring and the Bédossa scoring is about the, um, the evaluation of the, the activity. I don't think there is, uh, there is no difference for the fibrosis no. staging, but he, he proposed a new uh, scoring uh, to evaluate the activity of the disease. Uh, the the nash CRN scoring from 0 to 8 with a problem of reproducibility with the, with the ballooning evaluation and Pierre Bedosa tried to improve this and propose a new classification that was more reproducible so there was a recent publication that evaluated it as a good tool. Uh, for fibrosis it remains the NASH CRN classification but maybe like for activity this new tool we will become the reference uh, very soon yes because it's more reproducible. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, next question uh, sent by Veronica. Uh, it's about combination, either according again to your experience or an interest to combine uh, liver stiffness measurement and fibrometer results to increase the diagnostic performance in NAFLD patients. So once again, it's a very good question. Um, there are several ways to answer. The, the first is our experience in chronic hepatitis C. There are tons of data about the combination of uh, the physical method, FibroScan, and uh, the biochemical method, the, um, the blood fibrosis test. And all these paper, all these studies in chronic hepatitis C clearly show that you improve the diagnostic accuracy by combining both, uh, both methods. There is also the second answer, is a clinical case we discussed before. Uh, if you combine the, 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 the both methods, they correct themselves. If one is wrong, the second could correct the diagnosis. So it's always interesting to have both results, if you can have them. And uh, it also depends on the, of the concepts, there are some subtleties. Uh, and the third way to answer is that very recently, in mm -hmm. GEPATOL, there was a publication. Uh, I think it was the first study about the combination of uh, non-invasive methods in NEFL. It was a combination of the NEFL fibrosis score with FibroScan. And clearly, doing both tests increased the, the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. So when both methods are in accordance, you can assume that the diagnosis is really Better. right. So I think, yes, there is an interest to, to combine them. OK, answer is yes. Well noted. Thank you. So, um, next question um, is about uh, application of, uh, of FibroScan and FibroMeter in the context of pediatry. Is there, a, is there a potential interest to combine FibroMeter and, uh, no, sorry, is there potential uh, evaluation criteria hmm. to evaluate liver disease in children? What are the evaluation criteria, sorry, in chronic liver disease for children? Uh, so in children, uh, for the diagnosis of liver fibrosis, 
you can use FibreScan, but with another probe, uh, which is S-probe. And we know now that there is a good correlation between liver stiffness and liver fibrosis in children. However, at this time, you don't have any uh, study evaluating uh, the clinical correlation between liver stiffness and uh, children. And we don't have any information about the prognosis value of uh, liver stiffness in, in children. And we don't have specific studies uh, uh, for according to the, the etiology of the disease, so we don't have any study in NAFOL children, in HCV children, and so at this time you can use it, of course, but it's it's difficult to interpret it. I think there are some very small series of patients with liver biopsy and fiber scan. The problem in pediatric uh, world is that uh, physicians don't want to perform liver biopsy to children, so the, the, the series are very small. I, I agree with, uh, with uh, Victor, we, can, we can't make definitive uh, answer, but it seems, maybe you can confirm, that the diagnostic accuracy of liver uh, fibro scan is quite comparable to like in, in adults, but it's very difficult to compute because the, the data are very scarce. We need more studies, mm. I think so. Okay, thank you. So I suggest, because we have still a little bit of time, maybe to present a fourth clinical case and maybe later uh, there will be possibility again to address the questions sent by uh, all of you uh, to our experts. So let's maybe present a fourth clinical case directly related to the topic of this webinar. So Jérôme, it's a, ca a real case from Bordeaux. And so it's a male uh, with no alcohol use and just a yeah, statin treatment. And so it's 10 years ago, we just started using Fibrosan. And so I, I, it was an outpatient and uh, he, he, he arrived for uh, an elevated LT level, as you can see. And uh, he was overweight with BMI 27, uh, 27 with elevated waist circumference and at this time, it was, uh, we started to use non-invasive methods, so uh, we evaluated all methods. So he had a fiber meter, and the result was 0.02, fiber type 0, uh, uh, 19, and fiber scan 5.8 kilopascal. So it was in 2004. Hmm. So would you perform a liver biopsy now in 2014 to this patient? First, I would like to say to you that it's very difficult to trust you that it's a real case. So, a male who consumes no alcohol in Bordeaux. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, more seriously, uh, as we said, uh, before, he has a chateau. Yeah, of course, I know. Oh, be careful. <laughs> so, um, the, the, the context is quiet. There is no criteria for only one the elevated waist circumference for the, for the metabolic and, syndrome. And statin. And statin. So, uh, two, two, two criteria. The negative predictive value of uh, test, non-invasive test, either the blue test or the fiber scan is very good. The results are very low. So I think I won't do a liver biopsy. I will trust all these results because they are very low. The negative predictive value is very good. And they are all in agreement. OK, so, so no next liver slide. But what did you do? But you will have all the story of this patient. It's a 10-year story. So next slide. So it was in 2004. Uh, I hope we have the story, but yeah. So as you can see, in 2004, we performed a liver biopsy. And you, as you can see, fibrosis was F1, and uh, steatosis was 15%. And therefore, every year, we perform an evaluation of liver fibrosis, so in 2005, 6, 7, 8. And as you can see, except once in 2007, the fibro test was higher for another condition, I think so. But as you can see, fibro scan was quite stable, except in uh, 2008, but he, he, he was obese at this time. So uh, he, he, he was 27 in 2004, and now his BMI is 32. Next slide. So you will have the story now. So as you can see now, uh, in 2009, 10, and 11, he, has, uh, he had another examination. Uh, and as you can see, every C is stable. Next slide. 
At the end of the story, in 2014, in 2013, we perform a third biopsy. You, you, you have to check that in 2009, we perform an, a second liver biopsy, and fibrosis was always F1, but with an increase of uh, steatosis, around 70%, but at this time, his BMI was 32. But as you can see, liver stiffness was quite stable, but in uh, 2013, I performed another liver biopsy because at this time he, he had an elevation of ALT level. And as you can see, uh, fibrosis was always one mm. and steatosis was around 40%. And as you can see, in 2013, all parameters are in accordance with histological uh, result, liver stiffness, fibro test. I don't have fibromatter, but it was F1. And as you can see, CAP was 355, and steatosis was 40%. So now this patient is waiting for another liver biopsy, maybe in two or three years, I don't know. Would you perform liver biopsy uh, if, um, if all the results remain stable? Because you have a good experience in these patients. So I think that the non-invasive tests say the truth. So if nothing change, would you perform liver biopsy in three or four years? Uh, if if yeah. nothing changed, but but uh, he, he will accept another one. But because when I ask him for an, a third one, he said yes, I can go and I have no problem with liver biopsy. So, but I'm not sure we will perform another one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we, we received a, f a couple of other questions uh, sent by our participants. Uh, the selected one is about uh, about statuses grading by cap. Will a grading of statuses by cap be possible in the near future? Are there already data published or ongoing studies on this, uh, on this matter? It's uh, always cut off values. And so at this time, we, we, as I said before, we don't have the answer. I'm, I'm not sure that the most important point is to quantify exactly statuses. Is there any clinical impact if you diagnose a 60% steatosis or a 70% steatosis? I'm not sure. Maybe uh, the, the exception could be uh, before liver transplantation, for the, for the graph before liver transplantation. But in other cases, I'm not sure it's quite relevant. However, sorry, however, I think maybe cut off values of CAP will be uh, very useful as prognosis factors or as uh, uh, factors related to uh, the metabolic syndrome. So I'm not sure we will have correct cutoff for CAP values, but CAP will be related to clinical information and clinical prognosis. And maybe it's this way we have to go. Okay, thank you, very clear. Uh, maybe we have time for, for our last question. Uh, last question, uh, just uh, sent by one of our participants. Do you still need fibrometer after performing a fibroscan examination? If yes, when? Um, it's always the, the, the question of uh, do I need one test or mm -hmm. two tests? I think it's not fibrometer after fibroscan or oh, fibroscan fibro after, after fibrometer. So you, you have a context, you have a, 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 an estimated risk, and the non-invasive test uh, allows you to increase the, the probability uh, 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 after, doing the, after doing the test. Clearly, in our center, it's very easy to have both. So mm -hmm. we always perform both tests to, because we know that in certain situations, uh, one test can correct the other, the other one. one test. If you don't have uh, the, the, the two tests, you have to first do the one you have and ask do the question, is it in accordance with the, with the context? As we said before, there was a huge metabolic syndrome with a very normal uh, fibrometer. And it happens also sometimes that uh, you have uh, 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 a very uh, high context of uh, metabolic syndrome and a quite normal fibro scan. In this case, I'm very careful because I don't want to miss advanced fibrosis in my patient because this patient needs to be cared. So mm. if I have any doubt, clearly I do both. You do both. Okay. Okay, thank you. 
So uh, I think uh, our third webinar session concludes now. Uh, I would like to thank you for sharing your experience with uh, all of us today. I thank you also all thank the you. Uh, connected participants for sending us uh, their questions. I would like, uh, of course, to remind you that this was a recorded event, so there will be a possible review, replay of this event available on the Ecosense TV. And for the questions we unfortunately could not address today, we will send you uh, the, the, the answers to the questions to all of the participants uh, very shortly. So for any additional information, uh, you can contact uh, us directly. And uh, again, thank you, for, thank you all for your participation. And uh, we hope this clinical class was, uh, was useful and you will participate to the future uh, clinical events. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.